God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, even though there are times in life in which we forget about and sort of become numb to the grace and the gifts and the provisions that you have made for us, keep us mindful, Lord, that all things come from your hands. And let us be thankful, Lord. Let us be thankful especially for that gift of salvation that comes only through your Son on the cross. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Bad breath and smelly feet. These are usually not the top qualities that we look for in a romantic interest or a neighbor or a co-worker or a friend. Hence the obsession to, by those who possess these malodorous emissions to eliminate their social impact. Now, suggested home remedies for halitosis, which is bad breath, include chewing a whole clove, brushing your teeth twice a day with baking powder, scraping your tongue with a tongue scraper and then swishing with Listerine, um, sucking the juice of a lemon, chewing sunflower seeds, then drinking water, um, eating parsley, um, the, oh, then there's always soaking dental floss in tree seed oil and using that. All of those are suggested remedies. And for those who suffer from fragrant, if not flagrant, feet, there are also quite a few gimmicks that you can try, such as changing your socks twice a day, uh, putting absorbent cornstarch on your feet, taking oral zinc tablets, they say, helps, and using armpit deodorant and uh, antiperspirant on the soles of your feet and between your toes. People actually do that. But the most common remedy for those who have embarrassing foot stench is to soak your feet in black tea solution twice a day for 30 minutes at a time. They say it over the week or so, the smell will go away. But obviously you're going to have to have a lot of, times on your, a lot of time on your hands or more accurately on your feet for that solution to work. You know, there's got to be a better solution for those who suffer from these uh, pungent mal maladies here. I mean, if we can put a man on the moon, if we can unwind DNA and create seedless watermelons, then surely we can come, come up with something to help those putrid body parts of ours. Well, there is. We are told that bad breath and smelly feet are caused by bacteria. And British researchers have discovered a bacteria that actually eats and kills the bad bacteria that cause these problems. I mean, think of the commercial applications here. Eat ba good bacteria to take care of bad bacteria. Fill your socks with beneficial microorganisms to get rid of your socks full of the detrimental organisms. I know, I know, it's, it sounds almost absurd, you know, like the old childhood nursery rhyme, there was an old lady. You remember that she swallowed a spider that wriggled and wiggled and tiggled her inside. She swallowed a spider to catch the fly. Why she swallowed, uh, I don't know why she swallowed the fly. Perhaps she will die. But it's odd to think <laughs> insects to cure insects. Bacteria to cure bacteria. But consider the strangeness of how to cure a snake bite in our text for today. You cure snake bites by staring at a snake on a stake. That's the prescription given to the children of Israel in Numbers 21, our text for today. It seems the children of Israel had been long wandering out in the desert and their displaced journey from the enslavement in Egypt to the sacred home of the promised land. And of course, life was frustrating. No home was 
permanent. It was always temporary. And the food, monotonous. Hey, honey, what's for supper? Manna. Manna again? Yep. Manna. Manna steak would taste good about now. <laughs> Imagine living with your, or camping with your family for 40 years. See, 10 chapters earlier in chapter 11, the children of Israel were already complaining about the food. And they were complaining about the manna. Manna porridge, manna bread, manna stew, manna pasta. And then already, I mean, manna wasn't bad food. The scripture says it tasted like honey, sweet and delicious. But if you eat lobster every day for years on end, you're going to eventually get tired of lobster as well. And so they went to Moses, give us some meat. And God was benevolent and merciful and gave them quail to eat. Well, here we're 10 chapters later, Numbers 21, and they're complaining about the same thing again. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? We have no food, we have no water, and we detest this miserable food. But this time, instead of God showing benevolence and grace toward them, he had already had it up to here with their complaining. And he sends them snakes. I hear snakes taste like chicken, but since it's unclean, they don't eat the snakes like they did the quail earlier. In fact, the snakes actually bite them and kill a lot of the Israelites. And now, instead of complaining, they turn to Moses and they confess. They say, Moses, we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Save us from these snakes. And Moses pleads with God to have mercy and grace upon his people. And as in the past, God does relent and grants them forgiveness. But the prescription for the remedy of a snake bite is kind of an odd thing here. A snake for a snake. Moses fashions a bronze snake and puts it on a limb and holds it before the people with the promise that whoever looks upon that snake will be healed. How odd of a remedy that is to look upon a snake and be healed. But when you think about it, it's actually quite beautiful. A symbolic anti-venom for the people. You see, the people knew it wasn't the snake that was healing them. It wasn't a magic snake, you know, like Aaron's staff that he threw down before the Egyptian uh, magicians there, and that snake that consumed and ate the rod snakes of the Egyptian and magicians. No, they knew it was God that was providing the healing here. But the beauty of it was God combining in that symbol the connection between their complaining and their punishment. When they looked at that brass snake on the stake, they realized they deserved this because of their arrogance, because they were insulting God by dismissing the provisions that he had provided over the years and complained about what they wanted, not what God had already provided. And so, perhaps the snake changed their attitude. And it did. It was a poignant reminder, this brass snake on the pole, of the connection between their sin and God's grace. What they had to do was realize through repentance their complaining, their sin, admit their sin, and that they could do nothing to heal themselves and look to that symbol of God's grace 
and there be healed. You see the connection here. Problem and solution in one symbol, the bronze snake on a limb. Like Max Lucado said, to see sin without grace begets despair. To see grace without sin leads to arrogance. To see sin and grace in tandem leads to deliverance. Our sin, God's grace. The solu problem, the solution. A work of God in response to the sin of his people was a poignant reminder to the children of Israel of what he was doing. And for the children of Israel, when they would see the bronze snake on the limb, they saw their sin and their salvation in that symbol. Now for you and I, we also have a symbol in which we see our sin and our salvation in the same symbol. From our gospel lesson today, as Moses was lifted up, or lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. You get what God is doing here? If bacteria cures bacteria, and the cure for snakes is a snake, then a cure for death is a death. Found in that symbol, the cross. Like the snake on the pole, the cross is a kind of hideous symbol. It's a picture of death. Horrible, painful death, a wanton disregard for life. It would be like looking at a gallows or a, an electric chair. It's not something that evokes compassion and mercy. And yet, for those of us with whom God's Holy Spirit has worked, yes, God's Spirit works in us the repentance, the acknowledgement of our sin. But we see in that horrible symbol also our healing, our deliverance, our restoration to health. That horrible symbol evokes in us a confession of our sins. Yes, God, we're the ones who put Jesus on the cross. It's our sins that you hung Jesus on that cross. And yet, as we think about that, especially during the season of Lent, we can also see and take time to meditate on the powerful grace that God has poured out on us through that same awful instrument, that same symbol of death and destruction. Because in the cross, you and I see healing. We see forgiveness. We see grace and mercy. Forgiveness given to us through confession and absolution. Forgiveness spoken to us in his word. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The ultimate sign of love. Our Savior hanging on the cross. The lavish outpouring of God's grace. Our God is a master artist, weaving in symbol and reality for us. There we have the complete masterpiece of God's redemptive painting before us. 
happening when the completed work of Christ on the cross meets the complete submission of our lives to God through faith in the forgiveness of sins. The lavish outpouring of God's grace through an act, a symbol that reminds us of both the cross, our sin, God's grace together. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses our human understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We stand and make confession of this faith that we share with one.